Welcome into the Illini Inquirer podcast. It's Jeremy Warner. It's Derek Piper. Uh, we appreciate Michael Tulip filling in as uh, Joey and I were heading back from Oregon, but Pipes, you and I, he did a great job breaking down what was a disappointing showing for Illinois against Ole Miss. Uh, we'll dive into a little bit of that. We'll dive into the opener against Eastern Illinois, and we'll dive into the big news that Tomislav Avisic uh, is eligible to start the season. Seemed like there were good vibes with him playing at Ole Miss. Uh, before we go there, how's the Grove, man? It was pretty cool. Yeah, I got to walk around and uh, I was going on a solo mission, so uh, I didn't have a, a crew to, to to live it up with. And of course, we had a game the next day, so uh, you got to keep that in mind, too. And uh, I wasn't overly aggressive. I, I didn't butt my way in, into anybody's tailgate, getting a food line as tempting as it was, because uh, there were a lot of really nice setups. You know, they, they do it fancy there uh, for some yeah. of them. And some bring like a chandelier and whatnot. So uh, it's high class on some of those. I, I don't need all of that. I just need to uh, something good to eat, something good to drink. But uh, it, it was a different world when you see the the attire for those games and um, certainly appreciate the the high-level football that's down there and, and the buy-in and whatnot. So I enjoyed it. I enjoyed a little uh, pre, pre-game pre type of day before uh, enjoyment of the football scene. Wish I had uh, a better Illinois and Oregon game to lock into. I, I will say I went to a sports bar and there's like 20 TVs in the main bar area. And 15 are on Bama, Missouri, and only one in the corner is on Illinois and Oregon. So I'm like, aren't you, aren't you guys used to flipping it to CBS at 2.30? But obviously a uh, different TV agreement now. But uh, I didn't have to pay a ton of attention to that after the first half. Thankfully, on my flight home, I actually got to lock in uh, my YouTube TV. Worked on the Wi-Fi. It's the best Southwest Wi-Fi I've had so far. So I, I got to watch the first half. And you know, didn't really have to log into the second half. I'm like, Piper's got this. I can go back and watch it later if I need to. Uh, but at the end of the day, I know Brad Underwood is disappointed in his team, but boy, that gave him a lot of fuel. And it feels like in the long scheme of things, that's probably exactly what Brad Underwood wanted. Uh, going into that practice with that kind of ammo this week saying, you guys aren't, you know what, like, you guys aren't crap uh, at going into this season. You still have a ton to prove because that team, that's an old team, and they took you to the woodshed. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure he really looked forward to this week of practice, look forward to talking to him on Sunday about just what that looked like and what he got out of it. But certainly, like you said, a lot of ammo and really a challenges team. Like how, we know you're talented. We know you got a lot of offensive ability. How tough are you? Like, are, are you a tough team? Because you got really knocked back on your heels by Ole Miss's physicality and aggression. And obviously defensively, he's going to continue to beat the drum that they're not nearly good enough at that end. And they give up 91. Ole Miss made some really good shots. They're going to be a good offensive team. Chris Beard has coveted a nice collection of talent there, and they're an older group. Obviously, as Brad said, that's a big reason why he wanted to play them. But uh, I know turnovers will be something that we're going to have to monitor early with this group, although Brad said that against Butler that was really not an issue, and in practice he didn't see that. So is that a one-off, or is it going to be something that sprouts up, especially against some of these better teams when you got – a new collection of talent that has to figure out how to play together. And as things get sped up and you get in the heat of the moment, can you execute? So uh, a lot of different guys did not perform up to what the standard is. Um, I think especially on the note of effort and intensity, that will that will be a non-negotiable. That'll be something that Brad will not stand for. So uh, I think the response will be really interesting. But you got a, an easy start to this schedule, which I know we'll get into. But Really, you're less than three weeks now from facing Bama, and that's going to be a big, big test. Uh, I think it, for me, it was just kind of, and I think for everybody else out there, it's kind of just a, we say it throughout the offseason, like, yeah, it'll be a process, and it'll take time for them to be who they're going to be later in the year. It, but it was watching it like, oh, th- this this is a climb that will have to happen. But uh, Brad's a great coach. There's a lot of talent, and it's going to be fascinating to see how that process goes. Yeah, we'll dive into it here a little bit later. But there, there are reminders that, oh, yeah, Kylan Boswell has not proven himself to be a go to guy yet at this level. Oh, Will Riley, he's 18 years old <laughs> and then he's, he's doing this for the first time against grown men. So I think all those things cropped up a little bit. Uh, but to get to the big news uh, of yesterday, Thursday, recording this Friday, uh, one of the real bright spots for me was watching Tomasov Visic uh, and, and being kind of everything I thought he would be in that. He might not be the guy at the end of the day with 20 points and 15 rebounds or anything like that, but just everything he can do uh, just opens things up uh, and just kind of answers a lot of questions that Illinois needs of a five-man who can stretch the floor but also protect the rim. And then you get the good news, Derek. I felt like it was going well, the fact that he got to play at Ole Miss and ends up being that way because 
Uh, Illinois announced yesterday that Tomasov Visic will be cleared to play. He is available for the opener against Eastern Illinois. He is eligible. Uh, the interesting parts of this is he loses a year of eligibility, so he's technically a sophomore, and he'll have to make a financial repayment uh, by no, uh, donating to a charity of his choice as part of the reinstatement process. We can dive into that here, Derek, in a second. But first of all, having a Visich from the start of the season, what's that mean for Illinois? It's huge. It's absolutely huge. And I know that we've talked about it. Having him available allows you really to take advantage of what's become a pretty deep front court, at least on paper. When you look at a Visich and then an obviously highly talented freshman behind him in Merez, and you factor in um, Rick out to the four, Kerry Booth, who's, who's played at the high major level as well. And being able just to have that, that full allotment of, of bodies and, and be able to really equip yourself with a, a, a nice front court, which obviously has a lot of skill um, when you got the three point shooting of, of Visich and um, Rick House and Booth. And obviously Merez brings something a little different with his athleticism and um, toughness and all those type of things. But you get legit size of the five. Merez is a little bit. Uh, he, he's not small by any means, 6'9", 250, um, maybe even getting close to 6'10". But as far as that, and I'm not saying that Visage, like we've talked about many times, is going to be this this big-time shot blocker, but he is a presence in the paint, certainly. And you get that stretch-the-floor dynamic, which is something that I highlighted in my article earlier this week about the offense. That was probably the biggest thing that really stood out and that I liked uh, about this uh, thing, this offensively for in the Ole Miss game is just – all the different things you could do with him on the court at the five. You could, we didn't see the pick and pop game because Ole Miss was switching ball screens. I think that will happen a lot. And the Visas has shot the three really well. Uh, I know in the lead up to this, this season, but also uh, overseas as well, but you can short roll him. If you get blitz, you can uh, have him in, in dribble handoffs. You can space him out and use different guys in screening action. You use like Trey White as a pick and roll guy. Use um, Rick House as the screener and space the Visas out to the, the corner or the wing. So, uh, I, I really liked what, what he showed. And then obviously, too, in, in the post. Illinois didn't have a post presence in their starting lineup last year. Uh, Coleman brought plenty to the table. And, yes, when you had Dane in there, you, you had that as well. But he can go to the the paint and good touch and form and whatnot uh, there as well. So I was really encouraged. And 20, 21 years old, and uh, I almost feel like maybe I undersold all that he can do production-wise going into this year because we get latched on to a whole bunch of different options. We'll see how he does against a bigger front court because Ole Miss didn't have a ton of size at the five. But he, the early returns in that game in particular were really, really encouraging. He just had no one else like him, right? Like uh, somebody, you know, Kerry Booth can stretch the floor. Merez Johnson can rebound. You know, Tomasov can do a lot of those things. Like he, he can just do a little bit of everything. And if you're playing the Ilana Enquirer podcast drinking game, be ready because – I'm going to make this comp yet again. I know I've made it all off season, but he just does that rink mass thing where he's just kind of a fulcrum of everything they do. He opens up everything and allows everybody else to kind of play a little bit better. So I just think he can have that kind of impact. And to me, that's, that's high regards. I just thought rink mass was so important to what Nebraska did last year. So even if he's not like the star of this team, the leading scorer, maybe even one of the three leading scorers. I just think his impact is going to be as high as, as, as a lot of players uh, on this team. So I, I just think it's huge to have him, Derek. And here's the thing. like On the one hand, this is kind of an odd reinstatement to have to give up a year of eligibility. I, I don't think it's he's the only one to ever have to do that. Um, I was kind of trying to research some of that stuff. And, and the repayment, like Kofi Coburn had to do something with that when he took some money when he came back from the NBA draft. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Tomasov Visic was never going to be here for four years. He's making an IL. He, he's got the money. Um, so at the end of the day, this is a win for Illinois. Just to get him on the court, because if you get him for two plus years, I, I think he'll be here too. If you got him for a third, that'd be great. I, I just don't think you're ever getting him for fourth year. He's already 21. This is a guy that's going to play in some kind of professional league. Huge win uh, for Illinois. So kind of an odd kind of deal here with the NCAA and what the NCAA's role is, but I, I think it all works out for Illinois. Yeah, I agree with all that. It really was, I think, uh, certainly if you could say best case, you get the four years. But like you said, that was really never thought to be what would happen for him. And, and we talked about, I think, even when he was added or shortly after that, it's been viewed as kind of like a two-year window. Uh, then kind of reevaluate things. He's, he'll be 23 years old by then. You'd imagine that he's shown enough at that point. Will he be an NBA prospect? Potentially. Uh, if not, he'll probably have a chance, especially if he's had a good amount of success to go make an, a nice living overseas and in one of those really good pro leagues too. So that's certainly what his, his mind has been set on certainly. So tr giving that up is, is a trade that Illinois make 
uh, all day, every day, as far as that goes. And if he does have to repay back something and uh, get that done on the front end and not miss any games, that's a, that's a big time win. And just to have this whole thing sorted out, I know that uh, in, in writing after he was cleared for this past exhibition game, you, you did, I, I kind of outlined some of the differences between him and, and Zvonimir in terms of the timeline. Like Zvon, Zvonimir didn't even get into Kentucky till October. So that process was all delayed. So certainly there's some academic stuff involved in that as well. So just to, to get him in in July, as they did on campus, and to really get the ball movement on that and allow him to be cleared for this start of the season and, and to get the exhibition under his belt as well, that is all uh, certainly very, very positive. So, um, yeah, and I, I, it's interesting, Jeremy. I wonder, like, what was the back channel communication like? Were they Was this a negotiation? Like, hey, we'll give right. this and that. And with That's the, the thing. Like, we're not, that. not, not going to share that with us because it's right. all you know, student um, – privacy kind of stuff but like yeah it would be interesting to, to those conversations those emails back and forth with the NCAA you know Brad was a and he, he's been this way I mean think of the legal process he, he's been very stately he's been very diplomatic uh and how, how he talks about those things but uh, I wonder behind the scenes how this all went down 100 percent, yeah and like you said though I there had to have been enough and, and certainly there was back and forth to get to a point where he's cleared for the exhibition and, and Brad shared that as far as there was enough communication with the compliance and the NCAA that this wouldn't hurt his, his eligibility status and that they were giving them a green light on that. So, uh, but yes, around that time and, and digging around and asking some people like, yeah, this seems like a very, very good sign that he'd be cleared in time for the opener or just very, very soon. And uh, I don't think Illinois starts him and uh, without a feeling like they have him there right off the bat. Yeah, like, we need to get Kerry Booth some reps. We need to get Merez Johnson 30 minutes tonight or something right. like that. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and, and that shows his role too. He's he's the primary guy at the five. Merez certainly will factor in, but uh, he played the third most minutes in that exhibition behind Kylan and and Casperis. So, uh, they're very high on what he can bring. Yeah, Ben Hummerkhaus only getting one rebound would not have been encouraging for a small ball five uh, as well. We'll dive into that a little bit. The other part is Derek just have the whole team. Right? There's no like four games into the season or going to Alabama. It's Avisic's first game. Right, like going up against the you know top five team in the country, maybe the number one team in the country, that would have been really, really hard uh, for for Illinois. So to have these three games to kind of find a rhythm to roll, identify, which I think is really important for this team early on, I think that's great. Because um, I even think of a you know the Big Ten championship year when Kofi Coburn's out those first three games, right? And you're you're trying to figure out how does this team gel, and the first game back with Kofi. Looked like a team that hadn't played together, and they got smacked by Cincinnati in a disappointing loss in Kansas City. So I think that's another factor here, just having these guys together for the exhibition and now three games that you're a big favorite in, kind of these warm-up games for Alabama, I think is big for your chance to just kind of roll identify and get some rhythm. Absolutely, yeah, especially because you're so new on this front end of establishing a a total team identity of of how – they're going to operate in terms of rotations as far as what they really want to lean on and on, on the offensive end as far as scheme and, and who they want to play through and how that uh, tends to go. So if he was in a situation where he missed five games, three games, whatever it might be, not to say it, it would be something they couldn't overcome, but he's then entering a situation and their team makeup would change in terms of maybe who they are. They got to play different when Merez is in there at the five and, and defensively things change when maybe you're playing small ball with Humrek House or you're playing carry there at the five as well. So it is just about getting everybody on the same page. Uh, I know that uh, Mike's talked about this and then and we have as well uh, that this summer, that, that's where it was different. You didn't have at one time, you didn't have everybody uh, at one given time. There was, there was never everybody on this roster on campus at the same time. So they had to play catch up as far as that goes. Just dystopia. Visich was a little, a little late, right? Kasparis or Kaspers was going back and forth, playing Will some Riley, of these international. Will Riley, yeah. So it, it took a while to get all these guys together. Yeah. So not dealing with that into the start of the season is important, especially with the schedule that you have lined up for yourselves. Yeah. Uh, all right, Derek. Let's dive into Eastern Illinois tip off seven o'clock Central Time. Uh, it'll be on the streaming Big Ten Plus, um, but. Uh, Great first chance to see this team in real action. Of course, this is not the biggest test. Eastern Illinois, 304 in the Bart Torvik, 332 in Kempom. Nice pay game uh, for Illinois. But what are you hoping to see after what we saw at Ole Miss? What, what are the key things you're looking for 
as they tip off this season and kind of point them in the right direction? I think I'll be looking first and foremost at the veterans because that was something that guys who are proven in high major basketball that have started a lot of games that have played a lot really were underwhelming, especially as things went sideways early in that game at Ole Miss. Kylan Boswell ultimately did some nice things. Uh, I liked it as his fast break impact and pushing the ball. And I, I highlighted that in, in the film breakdown. Uh, he ended up with a handful of assists. He had some rebounds, uh, hit a three, but he just seemed to be too non-existent when it mm -hmm. built out to be a 20 point lead for Ole Miss. So him establishing himself, finding that chemistry with, with Casperus as well to where I don't want to, not saying that we won't. And, and sometimes maybe it, it gets blown out of proportion because there is kind of like, this guy has it going. So I'll take a little bit of a back seat. but I remember, remember how many times we talked about why can't Trent and Io both have a good game together? I'm not saying we're I'm not starting all that, but let's just get that chemistry built up. They play off each other. Well, I'm not saying that they didn't in that game, but I think that's important, but really defensively, because I, the staff thought of him as being a defensive stopper on the ball. And he was not that against Ole Miss. And does he have the ability to be a tone setter defensively? He took onus after and talking to him after the Ole Miss game, like, Hey, our, our intensity defensively and execution is down. And Terrence was somebody last year. And I know they only didn't have a good defense, but people could follow his lead. And he set a bar that was pretty high and, and it's on Kylan to do that as well. Ty Rogers was really bad in that game against Ole Miss. Can he be better? more steady. Trey White made mistakes with turnovers, both those guys turnovers in the first 10 minutes. So uh, that trio has played a lot of high major basketball. Um, certainly Ben Humrechaus is experienced in college basketball in general too. You could throw him in there and he didn't have a good game against Ole Miss. So I, I want to see those guys step up because the, the freshmen, the young guys are going to make mistakes. They're, they're going to, in this early portion, have inconsistencies one night where they have it, one night where they don't, or just sloppy turnovers, what, what have you. Illinois vets need to, on the front end of the season, my in my opinion, need to really answer the call. I just went back and, and thought of this as you were talking, Derek. Um, so I was listening to, <laughs> I was researching this, but I think you hit on it because it, it's not the first time we've seen a transfer come in here and kind of have to figure things out once games get going, right? Because you can practice all these things. But remember Alfonso Plummer? Like was no non-existent kind of his first four games at Illinois. I went back and looked at that 6.3 points per game uh, in his first four at Illinois it included two at Marquette when they didn't have Kofi Coburn. So it's like, is, is this guy going to be as good as they thought? He had six against Cincinnati and it was a really disappointing loss. Uh, and then you go back to Matthew Meyer. I, he was an all big 10 third team guy by the end of the year, his first eight games, he averaged, just to get this right here, he averaged 5.6 points per game. <laughs> and that went back. Marcus Damask had a good first two games, 12 uh, against Southern – against. Uh, oh no, that was Southern Illinois. Excuse me. Yeah, last year he didn't start off all that well. Um, I think he was double digits once in his first six. Yes. So his first six games, six points, seven points, 18, seven, three, eight. So I don't know. I mean, Terrence Shannon was a different animal. Um, he was really good right away. But – a lot of these guys have struggled a little bit, especially when it seems like they're coming up a level, Derek. So, so maybe there, there's something there with some of those guys. Kyle, you expect a little bit better, but again, he he struggled towards the end of last year against Arizona. So, I, the feeling out process for transfers seems like it's kind of carried over as well. Like the freshman, we expect some growing pains, but with the transfers, you do as well. So, I, I think that's where these growing pains are all going to come into with all of these guys kind of new to this entire thing. Yeah, and that's yeah. a great point. Um, certainly very fair. I think especially applying that, like you said, to Ben Hamrekhaus, making the, the jump from a different level, maybe that's a slower start for him ultimately. Um, even it could apply new new scene, new role for Kylan and, and Trey and those type of things. But I think kind of going back to just the idea of, yes, the fit could be different. The the usage on offense can be different. But the the raising the bar of toughness and intensity and what it takes to win at that level, like. Those guys should know. Kylan should know defensively what he has to – the mistakes he can't make, the the level of play that he has to have. Ty, obviously, on the glass and um, just limiting mistakes and not making freshman-like mistakes. And I think Trey with some of the turnovers too. And and Kylan threw a cross-court bounce pass that almost sent Brad into the second row. I, like his reaction, like uh, those type of things you got to you gotta limit and cut down because th there will be the head scratchers from – Casperus or Will or, or go on down the list. 
but those other guys really need to need to set that bar and, and allow guys to follow their lead because they've been they've been there before. Yeah, and unlike you know maybe Matthew Meyer was different because him and Terrence were kind of the guys on that team right away. You knew it. Um, these guys should know they're the guys like right away. Like they have to be leaders, and then that's probably what I'm looking for as, as much as anything. Derek is is intensity, uh, and a lot of that is on the defensive end. I, I think this team's going to figure it out offensively there's too much talent I, I like the scheme I like the ideas of what they do offensively way too much for this not to work eventually uh so it'll be up nights and it'll be down nights and even the other day you saw some ups and downs and mostly it was just turnovers right just taking care of the ball so you definitely want to see that uh improve but for me it's the the focus the intensity defensively and I know home workouts isn't going to be a great defender but you want to see the effort on the glass Boswell and Trey White, they need to be good defenders. Uh, and and they really weren't the other night. No, they definitely weren't. Um, yeah, Ben in space guarding is, is going to be – he'll have limitations, you know, similar to like a Marcus Damask had. But, yeah, rebounding has to be better. I know Illinois out-rebounded Ole Miss in that game, so it's not like they got killed on the glass. But still, especially when he's playing that small ball five at times, uh, you really need him to get after it and, and go there. And uh, He rebounded it decently at the, at the Missouri Valley level. But, yes, physicality, athleticism – very different uh, when you're playing at the high major, major clip. Um, so, yeah, I think that it's something that needs to be needs to be taken seriously, needs to be sent a message to those guys. Um, you know, there's a reason that Brad took um, Kylan Boswell and Ty Rogers to the Big Ten Media Days. There's a reason that he took Trey White to his Big Ten tailgate perform or uh, inter, uh, appearance yeah. there uh, for, for one of the tailgates. Um, those, those guys need to, to be tone setters and, and be – um, guys that are held accountable, especially early. So, yeah, that, that's something that you expected. You 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 obviously just wanted to get the most talent possible uh, and and went out there and got some younger guys. But there's a reason that you wanted some experience too, and um, it's because they've been here and and they need to be able to step up. Really encouraging performance by Dre Gibbs Wallhorn. He's going to have a role on this team, especially when he brings that intensity. Uh, and you see the offensive game that he can have. So if he can continue to gain confidence with that, he's going to play a big role. Maybe him and Boswell you know, can split minutes. Um, that that could definitely be a possibility. I think Boswell has certainly got the inside track there. But the one thing I like, Derek, is the two European players, they look the part. Kasparis needs to clean things up. Um, you know, the speed is is different, the size and physicality is different, but you could see the vision. You can see the playmaking ability. Um, you know, the pull-up jumpers off the bounce, like, I'm going to take those with him because he's really good. Uh, but Avishich, again, just looked the part, looked comfortable. Uh, so I was really encouraged by that, Derek, because those guys looked the part, certainly things to clean up with, with Kasparis, but those guys are going to be good. Yeah, KJ yeah. had moments both both high and low, certainly. I mean, the, the pocket pass to – Marez Johnson for that and one slam was was fantastic. He had a good matchup on Breakfield as a, a bigger forward, hit him with the hesitation and, and blow by. And he can do that. Now I know against some quicker athletic guards, maybe get into him. Not saying that he hasn't experienced that because he's played a lot of a lot of basketball against older guys, against high level competition. So I'm not saying that this will be the first time he's gone against that, but just kind of learning some of those lessons, not getting sped up, taking care of the ball, value, valuing the basketball to the point of Maybe the one-handed lefty passes uh, that, that can get you in trouble. Just kind of keep that in mind, and, and maybe uh, you know the whole fundamentals of, of jump stop and two hands and those type of things can come into play. He's going to turn the ball over at times. He's going to be flashy, yeah. um, but how it well? Shock you, Derek, if 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 Casper's led the Big Ten in assists and turnovers. Like I mean, you got to have a high usage role, but he's he's got the capabilities both ways of doing that. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think that's even that's very much built into the expectations of what the staff would would think would play out if you got their honest answer on it. So uh, but I, I think just learning from some things because, you know, a guy like Andre Curbelo was a little too stubborn with, with some of the more uh, high high degree of difficulty passes and, and pushing the envelope. So we'll see how that goes uh, for KJ certainly has uh, the shooting ability from the outside when you get him open and, and those type of things. So I'm not I'm not worried about him. There's going to be um, there's going to be moments where he'll be rocky, I think, and that was a reminder uh, there against Ole Miss. But on the whole, it looks the part for sure. Avicius, we talked about, uh, loved all the value that he brings, and and Dre can't forget about Dre to to steal the old uh, the line there. Uh, he's 
he's making it making it known. Um, it's a guy that that should be hungry. Uh, he's worked really hard and and he's played at this level. And uh, he's the one guy that really I think Marez played hard too, but had the juice defensively uh, that you'd want and kind of matched the intensity of Ole Miss. Really, one of the only guys on Illinois, if not the only guy throughout the course of the game that did that and uh, turned some defense into offense. He hit some threes. He got on transition. Did see one of the one of the really nice plays in transition was a an outlet from Kylan to KJ to Dre in the corner. So I know Brad talks a ton about positional size and he loves it, but is there going to, especially if DGL comes on more and more, is there going to be a, a move to go three guards? And we've seen mm-hmm. him do that in the past, you know, Trent Io and Andres Felice played plenty together. I'm not saying those guys are going to be the same, but I wonder, I think that's one thing to watch because Brad said he's still, he's still figuring out who works the best together. He said it in the clip that, was on their latest like hard knocks or whatever it's uh, ultimately called. You know, I, I don't know who to play right now. So I think it's all very, very open on what lineups they roll with and whatnot. And, and Dre, whether it's, yeah, in reserve of Kylan or out there with those guys, if he keeps playing this hard and, and shoots the three like that, he'll be in the mix. I texted the two up in the middle uh, of my flight across the Rockies. Derek, I was like, I already love Marez. I, I just – for a freshman to bring that intensity and effort uh, and to know his role and to know what he brings to the table and not try to be more than that, it's rare. It's rare. And it's a lot of things I like about Ty Rogers in a six foot nine, 250 pound package, right? Like it's, it's just Merez is, is a different level of that. And uh, listen, like there's some flaws there. He's got to learn a lot of things about the defensive positioning and all that, but the effort and intensity is always going to be there and he's going to make a big impact. So I, I just love what he brings alongside a, a great shooter like him, Rick House and, you know, Tomislav and all the skill that he brings to have that kind of bull in the China shop to be able to go to at times, I, I think is, is going to be really nice. Cause I mean, the first game I showed up and saw him and James Brown, James Brown was kind of, you know, I just didn't love the the intensity sometimes. And Marez was just, he didn't play like a kid that had that many offers and was already committed to Illinois, he played like a, the hungriest kid I've ever seen. So he's bringing that to the college level already. Yeah, that's what he's all about. 7.6 rebounds. Like you said, just really active around the around the boards, uh, in the paint. Will finish athletically when he gets the opportunity. We'll see some more pick and roll stuff. You'll see maybe against Eastern some lobs to, to Merez, which will open some things up for some highlight plays. And uh, yeah, he's going to play his butt off defensively too. And, and maybe it's not always, like you said, the, the right positioning and, and he'll make some mistakes. Um, but just the feel that he'll continue to to build up as he gets experience will only help him. So uh, like you said, really high on him. And, and one thing about having uh, Tommy there is like, you don't have to try to reel Merez back. You don't have to be like, well, we know you want to play with 110% intensity, but we need you 25 minutes. We need you to not get in foul trouble. I'm not saying they, they want to, don't want to avow, avoid foul trouble anyway, but you can let Merez loose and let him do his thing and, uh, understand you got the depth there at, f- at the five to not change the way Merez plays or, or dial back the intensity. You can let him be him, and that's going to bring some really good things for Illinois for sure. Yeah, he just does some things that remind me of Cliff O'Marui. Just uh, kind of maybe not as long, but just kind of brings that kind of intensity uh, to it. Um, the, the other guy, I guess, Ty Rogers and Kerry Booth are my interesting fringe rotation guys. Like, what are their roles going to be? How do they get – how do they have the path to, to bigger roles? Uh, Ty, it's with defense and turning the ball over less. He, he can't turn over the ball. He's got to get to the rim, finish, make free throws, all of that. And now with Tommy here, uh, Kerry Booth's path to playing time seems pretty small there. For sure. Yeah. Uh, I know that Kerry, they, they like the skill set. They like the potential. Uh, and I think he'll make some threes when he gets a chance to go out there and, and get those shots. But certainly with, with, with Tommy in the mix and, and also – uh, Merez, obviously, Ham is going to play a lot, uh, as we already have outlined and discussed. That it will be hard to come by. I think he'll get some chances. I, I thought it was interesting. He was the first guy off the bench mm-hmm. there against Ole Miss. I don't necessarily expect that to to continue, but he'll get some chances to to show what he can do, especially in some of these bye games. Obviously, but it will be hard for him to get consistent minutes. That will be something that he'll have to try to to work for and fight for, make it to where Brad can't sit him on the bench an entire game. Ty. He's played a lot of minutes. He was a starter every game last year, obviously. But the dynamic changes when you, you bring in Trey and you bring in Will and, and there's a lot of competition on the wing. And like you said, you, 
he's got to be a plus defensively. Um, and, and he probably should now guarding wings almost primarily. Um, so that's something that he's got to show, got to rebound. That's probably his greatest asset uh, when he's playing with the motor that he has and then just limit mistakes offensively. And when you can go to the rim, finish and shoot free throws a little bit better maybe than last year. Don't overcomplicate it and uh, just be a, be a plus defensively and on the glass and just try not to hurt this team offensively. And then I think you'll get chances. But yeah, that wasn't a great – there's only one game, and uh, everybody struggled, but Ty did not look great uh, there in Oxford. Uh, Derek, before we go out of here, uh, we each had a piece up today. I wrote about the European influence on this roster, going to get Tomey and, and Kasparis. And it had been a three-year process where, where Jeff Alexander uh, told me, he decided three years ago, we're, we're going to recruit overseas. So that included going over there and going over there. And it took some time, but uh, they've – really got built relationships with the agencies over there. And now they have two of the three highest ranked European players that are playing in college basketball today. And with NIL, Derek, two of the top four in the draft class of 2025, according to ESPN, are over here. They're not all coming over here, but that money is enticing these kids to come play college basketball. They see that maybe this improves my draft stock. Not only because you're playing against maybe better competition and developing more, but it, it is easier for scouts to see you, even though they're all over the world. It's a little bit easier, but um, you acclimate to this game, you acclimate to the competition and the style of play over here, and you get to make a lot of money doing it. So guys like Igor Dem Demon and Kasparis and, and Tommy, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how this goes. But talking with Jeff and Brad, they're all in on this, Derek. Like they, They're all in on, on this European experience. And, boy, they have the money to do it. They're starting to have the brand to do it, the university – has the international feel, of course, to it. Um, so I, I don't know if they're going to be Gonzaga in five or ten years, but I think that's the goal, <laughs> talking to them. like I think they they see this. If Kasparis and Tomey have as much success as they think, that this can really feed on each other and open up a huge talent pool for them. Yeah, there's a lot of opportunity overseas, and you see it, just how much talent is coming from uh, international when you look at the NBA, uh, certainly. And, yeah, I mean, places like Gonzaga and, and Arizona – Done a really good job here. Uh, Gonzaga had certainly the, the long track record. Then Tommy Lloyd going to Arizona opened some of that up for them as well. Um, you know, Michigan with the with the Wagners and whatnot. So uh, there is plenty of talent to be had. And this with NIL is able to sway guys who normally would, you know, go play for, you know, maybe Casper's is playing for Barcelona's like top tier team this year before then trying to get picked in the, in the first round. So uh, that changes the dynamic. Totally, where Illinois can outbid Illinois and other places can outbid them with NIL and make it make sense financially. Give them the maybe easier access to NBA scouts, uh, easier access to just having primetime TV games to get seen, the exposure, and then you're going up against not not obviously there's there's really good leagues overseas, but you're going up against fellow guys that you're competing with for spots in that draft. So there's great opportunity. Makes a lot of sense for the player now with the NIL. And then for Illinois to go over there, and like you said, they have a ton to sell. They've put the effort in. I know that – and talk knowing just Jeff's travel log, uh, hearing about all the FIBA stuff he's gone to, all the yeah, countries. Yeah, I could send you over there with him, man. No doubt, right? That'd be awesome. You know, he's he's been Italy and Spain and France and Australia and, uh, you know, oh, and Brad obviously went to to Montenegro uh, to talk to, to, to Tommy. So, yeah, it's – there's a lot of opportunity. It, it is it's a less what's the right way to put it? less saturated market or there's there's less contenders over there there's more it's more of an open field not saying that you know these are all unmined gems these are all guys that people have never heard of because you got these FIBA games that are, are highly you know publicized and whatnot but uh, I think that you look at the AAU circuit and, and there's just a lot more everybody is entrenched there where there's probably less programs that are over there being fully committed to it, wanting to go on. It's a big investment of time yeah. of money to go over there and Illinois timed this up. Well, I know NIL was kind of coming out, but kudos to them for kind of having the foresight of, Hey, we, we have the money now to bring these guys over. Cause you think of some of those guys that get drafted, their rights are held for a couple of years and then the NBA teams have to buy them out. Uh, now those guys, you can just have that money right there and, 
the agencies are, are usually based in America that have guys that, that are over there. So to have those ties of what Jeff has built, what Brad is starting to build in Orlando, of course, you know, Illinois had some international flavor, um, you know, with Caribbean with Orlando Antigua, they went over and got Matisse Vasil. It was a different level of prospect, obviously, but they've kind of been tinkering with this, but now they're at the, the highest level. Like this is a Gonzaga like hall internationally when you include Will Riley in it. Um, and yeah, you're right. Like Gonzaga, Illinois, Arizona, BYU, Kentucky, it seems like has, has been in that, but it's not as crowded as some EYBL event you're probably going to. For sure. Yeah. And, and it stacks up where they're outside the natural kind of live periods, but there, there are exceptions when you got overseas uh, with FIBA and whatnot. Not everybody makes the effort to go over there. And I, you make a good point as far as financial commitments uh, from your, your DIA and all of that uh, that goes into it. And just the, the time, you know, it's, it's certainly a big time commitment and, and, and making those flights and, and whatnot, but uh, credit to Jeff, hell of a professional move by Jeff Alexander. Not saying it was like a solo, like only his idea, but, it's really added a, a ton of value uh, to what he brings to the table. He's He's got in with uh, influ influential people over there, whether it's just, uh, you know, professional teams, but really agents. I know that in your article that really highlights the fact that agencies are really important, the dialogue that happens there, and just uh, being seen, just similar to, you know, an AAU event or similar to, you know, what we do. I know it's, it's different, but uh, – being front and center, having a presence, developing relationships, that all matters. And and there's there's got to be a trust factor to it. I know in, in talking to Jeff uh, as well, you, you hear that is like they got to trust you. And I think when you can build maybe a a reputation here, if Illinois does great with KJ, if Illinois does great with, with, with Tommy, that will sell really well back to the next cycles of, of international talent, but also just going over there and and knowing that you got their best interests and that you're good, that you got a good program and foundation for people to be successful. And that's important. We, we developed you, you got paid what you, we told you were going to get paid. Right. Yeah, and yeah. we set you up for future success. Like you played an offense, you had the role you wanted, all those things. And you saw Gonzaga it was just, they were getting every international guy, every now Arizona's kind of been doing that. So uh, if Illinois can have that build on each other. The other thing I think that was interesting is, is Brad talked about, and I didn't write too much about it in the story, but he said that the transition for these guys is a lot easier than it used to be because KJ has been in Barcelona since he was 15. Like he's been away from home since he's 15. Um, Tommy lives in Croatia and he's been in Montenegro for the last you know, year and a half, two years. And it's been in Belgrade, like all, all these different things. Like they, they've kind of seen the world. They've, they've learned, they know English. Like they know the language a little bit better than guys like Matisse over here. So the transition has been a little bit easier. Plus they want to be where their idols are. And who do you think KJ has been watching? It's Luca. He likes Shea goes this Alexander too. He's had me uh, told me, but uh, he, Luca is obviously a European star, especially in the eastern side of of Europe. And then, of course, Tommy's like I love LeBron James, but of course, I'm watching Nikola Jokic. And um, you know, those guys want to play where, where their heroes are, are kind of playing, and you know, they think the path to the NBA is a, a little bit easier over here. So um, it's it's fascinating. It'll be fascinating to watch it kind of build on itself. Uh, Derek, you just put up a, a Big Ten superlatives. Good, good luck figuring out the Big Ten um, in, in November because <laughs> this is going to be interesting. It will be very yeah. interesting. Yeah, um, it, it was a fun task to try to tackle, certainly. Um, I've said it here before that Indiana is my pick to win the league. Um, Mike Woodson is the big detractor there, the reason that it could all crumble. And, and I know that in the exhibition game against Tennessee, he played both. I think the Cowboys to win the Super Bowl, Derek. <laughs> Might be. Maybe. Yeah. Might be. Renu and uh, Balo both played 30 plus oh, minutes. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll see if they actually stagger them as much as maybe they could and, and play a little bit different. I, I think Miles Rice, the transfer from Washington State's the, the big X factor, the big thing that changes from last year to this year in terms of guard play. I spoiler alert, I have him as my my kind of dark horse sleeper pick to win Big Ten player of the year. I don't know that it's necessarily a sleeper, but he wasn't a preseason all league guy. And uh, I just think he's He's the captain of a ship that has a lot of options, a lot of a lot of talent, and uh, he can rack up assists as well as really go and get his own. So um, they did great in the portal. There, there's no doubt about it. Like they did awesome in the portal. That is a great roster. Just the coach. I, I don't know how he's, he's going to put it all together. Right. And on the note of coaching, I mean, um, 
not that this is necessarily new, but the new uh, additions West Coast wise get some really good coaches. Mick Cronin, Musselman, Dana Altman. I think Oregon's a lot better than maybe some people sh- are, are giving them credit for, especially if KJ Evans, former teammate, fun fact of Imani Hansberry. So I saw uh, Kwame plenty uh, there for uh, Team Durant on the UIBL circuit, but a guy that's got a lot of potential, maybe takes the Khalil Ware year one to year two jump, but actually stayed there at Oregon versus transferring out. So uh, I like them this year, but yeah, a lot of talent. I like the fact that you got to, should it be a good NBA presence? I mean, Dylan Harper and Ace Bailey at the very, very top of projected projections and draft uh, KJ, Derek Queen at Maryland. So there, there's, there's some real talent in this league in terms of NBA prospects, but yeah, it's, it's, it's very much a wide open league, especially you get down to the, the meat of it, the middle. And yeah. that's where I know in, in making the, the preseason picks, like good luck trying to sort all that out. Yeah, it's just where I sided with coaches. Like I was like, I like Iowa a little bit more because I know they're going to be at least solid. Like the floor is so high for a Fran McCaffrey team, but what is the ceiling? Because they don't defend. Um, but yeah, it's just it's kind of like football right now. I mean, five through seventeen, five through sixteen. Do you have any confidence of like, yeah, that team's definitely going to win this week? You know, going into Illinois, Minnesota, it's like th- there's not much difference uh, between those teams. So I just, yeah, it's going to be eighteen team leagues is wild. It's just absolutely wild and. There's not, not a lot of breaks on the schedule. There's not, no. And say what you want about the Big Ten. I think it's a league that's got a lot of depth yet again. Uh, you know, Penn State's down there at 17th picked-wise. and It was pretty good four. late last year, didn't they? Yeah, and I know we, we got a little bit of a uh, our, our own angle of it with them beating a, an Illinois team that went to the Elite Eight. But Ace Baldwin's a really good point guard. They got some shooting. Um, they, they got a couple of new bigs that, that maybe add some rim protection for them as well. And I think Mike Rhodes is a good coach. Um, I know Ben Johnson's bringing up the rear there and just got gutted by the portal uh, there with uh, – I know that they lost their point guard and, and Christie goes to the draft. So, uh, But a lot of that in between, you got USC with a bunch of newcomers, but they do have talent and Musselman's been transfer you before, so I think he could do it. Uh, UCLA is going to be really interesting with uh, a team that really disappointed last year, but on paper still has a lot of talent. Kobe Johnson from USC, a transfer in, is maybe the defensive player of the year in the league um, and a guy that's on NBA draft boards as well. So we're tipping it up here in a few days, man. It's going to, I know we got some bye games here, but it uh, should be really fun. All right. Last question I got for you. I don't know if you're able to stop and see the, uh, just uh, most, probably the most gut gut wrenching loss I've suffered as a Bears fan in quite some time. Uh, have you have you started making a coaching list already? Have you done it? Are you on that? I'll, just be, I'll do the easy and like everybody's talking Ben Johnson. Yep, that sounds good. Give me one of those, please. I'll go steal a guy. Give me Brian Dable. I'll take him. Just to, yeah, give sure. me an guy with my quarterback. Sure. Probably should have done it last off season. And uh, I think he's a good defense coordinator. I'll give him that. But yeah. Uh, that was- Brutal. Was Except for on Hail Mary coverage. Oh, man. I wasn't I wasn't watching. I decided to, I was like, oh, do I stick it out in Oxford and watch the game? But then I have a farther, you know, more later drive. I'm like, I'm just gonna drive. Yeah. And uh I watched the highlights at a hotel and it, Brutal. it made me feel a little bit better. I didn't have to, you know, I knew the I knew the outcome already versus yeah. watching it uh in real time. All right, that'll do it for us. Derek Piper, thank you, buddy. Always fun, man. All right, thank you to everybody for listening to the Illini Acquire podcast. Give us a follow, rating, review, wherever you get your podcast. Check us out on YouTube. Hit that like button, subscribe, hit the notifications bell. Everybody have a great day. Take care of each other. We'll talk to you next time right here on the Illini Acquire podcast.